thanks guys for having us. Um, really excited to be here today and, and chat with you guys a little bit more about Venrock. Um, Elliot, if you wanna to go to the bio slide, the only thing I was gonna mention um, for, for me, Joe, that you, you didn't mention is um, uh, the, a couple of the companies I'm involved with, some of which are in the, the Boston area, some of which are on the West Coast, and actually Inscripta is, in, uh, is, in, is in Boulder, Colorado. Um, Cytere Therapeutics is a really interesting company, now public, but had um, its start out of Jackson Labs. Uh, it's in the DNA repair space in oncology. Federation, as you mentioned, um, got its start in academia as well um, from two professors at Stanford that we'll chat about in more depth in a couple slides. Um, Prothelia is, a, is, a, is an early stage rare disease company. Uh, the work um, also started in the academic lab um, and, and, and has, uh, has an interesting story behind this resounding as that company. And Inscripta actually got started out of some technology at CU uh, based in Boulder, uh, some, some work around um, uh, sort of industrializing uh, gene, gene editing. Um, they, they're hoping to be what Illumina was to sequencing, but in the gene editing space. Um, uh, and the only thing I was going to add is on Federation Bio, I'm no longer the, the CEO there. We have a wonderful woman by the name of Emily Connolly, who we'll talk about um, in a moment, who uh, took the helm there about a year ago, uh, and I've transitioned to, to, to a board role there, which is uh, traditional for, for sort of a Venrock uh, com company creation. Super. Elliot, over to you. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so... Um... I am not involved with as many companies as Raquel. Uh, so my background will be significantly different. I wanted to give you guys a little bit of context for the academic research that I uh, that I did that kind of led me to finding venture and company creation as something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, I started studying transcription and gene regulation actually back at Wesleyan and then carried that through to my time at MIT, made it a little bit more interdisciplinary in Rick's lab while well, we started thinking about these ideas of phase transitions in biology, how they might relate to genome structure and nuclear organization. And, uh, and, and that was what led us to, to do point. Uh, and then I eventually started studying this disease called Rett syndrome because I, it had a really interesting uh, mechanism that we were finding that was, you know, again, in this space between phase transitions and transcription and gene regulation. Um, so yeah, that took me um, took me to Dewpoint, and and the work on Dewpoint made me really enjoy the idea of thinking about experiments in the context of a company. How you might take what you're used to doing in the lab as a PhD student, and um, you know, do it for a real applied purpose. Which um, you know, I had been really focused on basic science for a long time. So so the idea of biotech was really exciting when I started thinking about it myself led me to work with Flagship uh, at 5 a.m. towards the end of my PhD, uh, which led me to Venrock. Okay, so um, yeah, speaking of Venrock, uh, a little bit of background on the firm and the team uh, for you guys. Venrock is actually one of the oldest venture firms in the world. It was founded in 1969 um, by Lawrence Rockefeller as the venture arm of the Rockefeller family. So originally we were investing Rockefeller money. Now uh, we are no longer um, associated with, with the family. Um, and the mission from the beginning was to build businesses that really matter, um, that investments that will have real lasting impacts on the industries that they're involved in. And so we can uh, look at some of the companies we've backed and, and, and um, you know, I think that that really shows that that goal has been achieved in a lot of um, different investments from Benrock. So, um, you know, we kind of lay out the areas here that Venrock invests in from enterprise and consumer tech companies um, to health, uh, healthcare tech companies and then actual uh, healthcare companies, which is a lot of what we'll be focusing on today. But you can see some of the examples in the tech space like Intel and Apple, Dollar Shave Club, uh, Nest, Cloudflare, right, companies that have really made an impact on their, uh, on their industry. Um, and the healthcare IT space has been something that Benrock's focused on probably over the last decade or so, and Raquel, you can correct me if that's wrong, um, that has, uh, Benrock has really made a, a significant impact on that industry in particular. I guess Athena Health was probably the first one, and that was in 2000, so maybe it's been going on for quite a while. Um, and, but we'll talk about why I think Benrock has been able to be so successful in that space a little bit with, with our backgrounds with the team. Um, but then, so zooming in on the healthcare, uh, which is, obviously the team that Raquel and I are on, um, we really back companies in the tool space like Illumina and 10X Genomics, 
but then also in more traditional um, therapeutics, um, you know, companies making medicines like Juno, um, Regenix, Avexis, uh, Avexis, obviously like really important companies over the last couple of decades. Um, so, you know, like I was telling you guys before about the different areas we invest in, it really touches on what we think makes Venrock unique, which is this um, really interdisciplinary approach to investing. Um, and that stretches from our early stage tech team to our early stage healthcare team and our later stage therapeutics team. Um, early stage tech, you know, I mentioned some of the companies before, uh, entre uh, enterprise software and consumer services and software. Um, but early stage healthcare, you guys are all very familiar with. Later stage healthcare, I, I don't want to be too jargony. Um, so really what that team does is they focus more on crossover investing. So companies that are late stage private companies about to become public companies um, or public companies themselves. So things that are really more at a clinical stage in terms of the lifetime of the company, they have assets in the clinic. And this, our later stage therapeutics team really specializes in thinking about what the clinical outcomes are going to be um, for, for ongoing clinical assets. And, uh, and you might imagine now that the feedback between these teams is another aspect that makes Venrock really unique. We, you know, so from the standpoint of an early stage healthcare investor, we can talk to our early stage tech team about, uh, you know, different AI platforms and different AI approaches, which we see a lot on the early stage healthcare side right now. Um, and we can talk to our later stage therapeutics team about uh, the clinical endpoints for a particular indication that we're thinking about for one of our early stage companies. So we really have this crosstalk. We can, the teams can lean, each, lean on each other um, in, in a way that I think just increases our chances of, um, of success. Okay, uh, I think Raquel and I just wanna outline the idea first that there are many backgrounds that can take you to an early stage healthcare investing role. Um, and we can illustrate that with some of the roles that we have on the team, but then kind of just in, in, in general, um, what you could do to, to end up here. I think the most obvious for, and for many of the people that I would imagine are on this call um, is an academic training. So a secondary degree, like a PhD or an MD um, that really will train you to think about science in the right way and really be a good fundamentals investor um, in, in terms of science. Uh, and you know, if you have experience in a biotech, at a small biotech company or in strategic consulting or uh, in a venture fellowship, then that really adds the, the sort of lens that you might want to have as a venture investor onto that scientific training. So that, that's, uh, I think, a, one of the more obvious backgrounds and fits, fits my bill and another member of the team, Brian Roberts, um, fits that background as well. Uh, another common approach that we have a few team members that really fit is this operator approach, and that will apply to uh, drug development. Um, so, you know, team leadership or business development, um, at, at a company where you're, uh, you know, like a pharma or a biotech, big or small, um, but leading those teams and thinking about problems in that way, either from the, you know, taking a, um, a scientific asset through to, uh, to the clinic or uh, partnering on deals with different companies as a business development specialist. They're all skills that we think translate really well. So Raquel will fit this business development background. Um, and we have another member of the team, Mariana, uh, who really fits the drug development operator background. Um, another uh, type of background that will translate well into VC is consulting work. And then we have this unique background on our team, actually, that is uh, a specialist in healthcare systems. So Bob Kocher um, worked in the White House and uh, with McKinsey, really thinking about the way that healthcare services are delivered to um, you know, citizens in America and, and what are the different ways that that's inefficient, what, what are the ways that can be made more efficient, uh, Bob thinks about that all day and has really changed the game for our healthcare uh, IT investing space with, with that healthcare systems background. Um, so, you know, okay, so this just illustrates all the different ways that you can be knowledgeable in a way to uh, and apply that knowledge to investing. But we do think that there are unifying background qualities that don't so much relate to the specific training you receive, but rather to the type of person that you are. And those include things like wanting to work with entrepreneurs, gravitating towards early stage science and uh, you know, helping people, helping patients. And then the, another kind of key aspect is this ability to thrive in white space. So you, know, you don't necessarily have any structure given to where you might gather your ideas from or what you might do with an idea that you get from another person. 
um, but really thinking creatively in, in those areas and uh, the ability to work on a lot of different ideas at one time and, and actually enjoying that, um, being able to put something down when you're bored of it for the minute and then work on something else for the next hour, I think is, um, I mean, it's one of the things I love about the job um, and, and uh, I think makes you successful. Okay, Raquel, this is over to you. Thanks, Elliot. And the only thing I would add to the to the backgrounds that are interesting, I, I know we have on our first bullet that, you know, sort of technical backgrounds are good. And I, I would say they're they are certainly important in what we do. Um, we two folks on the team, um, my, myself um, and our colleague Cami Samuels, um, she's got an MBA. I'm I'm the least educated of everyone on the team. I just have an undergrad degree. Um, uh, but um, we both actually came from the kind of BD background, small company that um, grew quickly. Um, and, and so it's all to say that um, I think there are, there are ways to sort of supplement your experience that are, are very relevant to what we do on the venture side. Um, and I think the thing that really unifies us and, and Elliot, um, Elliot, Elliot mentioned this is we really, we really love working with entrepreneurs, um, with folks who have early ideas and frankly, ideas that are, you know, potentially sort of, um, you know, uh, not ready for prime time, sort of need some some thinking, some brainstorming around how to apply the idea. Um, and we'll get into some of that later um, in, in some of our slides about a couple sort of key things we always focus on and, and try to work with early entrepreneurs on that I think are highly relevant to this audience um, that might be thinking about kind of how to how to start a company out of some of the work that, that, that they have ongoing. Um, um, on the Venrock side, um, we're currently investing out of our ninth fund. It's a $450 million fund. Uh, VHCPEG is the name for the uh, crossover later stage healthcare fund uh, that, that, that is being invested now as well. Um, and it's a really nice sort of vehicle to help support our companies over um, their evolution and, and lifespan. Um, on the early stage side, uh, you know, we typically, uh, when we say early, we, we typically um, get involved at, at the seed um, or series A stage. We I think it's something like 80 to 90% of our deals, um, you know, we're the first sort of institutional capital in. Um, and, you know, the check size really varies. Uh, for, for seeds, it could be, you know, a million bucks um, and, you know, helping sort of shape the plan around key experiments and, you know, milestones, helping build the team. Um, or for more mature um, sort of teams and investments, um, you know, maybe the initial check size would be as large as sort of 15. And we certainly, uh, I think it goes without saying, but I'll say it, we just like all other uh, good venture funds, uh, reserve capital over the life of the investment. So it's not to say, you know, you see us in the early rounds and then we're not there. Uh, you know, we're really, you know, I think embodied in sort of the philosophy um, of building businesses that matter, we uh, we we really um, are there to support our companies uh, through all of the twists and turns that inevitably happen um, as as one builds a company, and especially in the biotech space. Um, the investment horizon for us can be you know five to ten years. Um, it, it's again um, not not a strategy for us uh, uh, to, to sort of look for a quick flip. We're really again. Uh, trying to build businesses that can stand on their own two feet, uh, that can control their own destiny. And oftentimes, um, especially on the, the, the therapeutic side of things, um, you know, that can be that can be five to 10 years. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, Elliot, if you want to move to the next slide, what do we look for in kind of an investment? And I think this is a relevant this is a relevant concept because a lot of this sort of dovetails into how do we think about, you know, new company formation. Um, uh, but it's also how we look at um, existing companies that, you know, are maybe a more traditional sort of, you know, Series A type deal. Um, a, I think one of the things that makes Venrock pretty unique is um, we, we do tend to gravitate towards sort of platform science. It's not to say that um, every deal of ours is a, is a platform type deal. Um, I should say that's, that's something... Um, on the Venrock side, where where you know it, it, there is also sort of no uh, a sort of thesis around you know no rules. So so you know we don't always do X, we don't always do Y, but the majority of of of, of times I would say we do tend to gravitate towards sort of platform companies. Um, you know, groundbreaking new biology uh, and or a sort of new technology, um, and then sort of applied to um, a, a you know, interesting set of indications, um, otherwise known as diseases, 
um, you know, where there um, is strong defensibility. So, you know, IP is something we're not going to talk about uh, today, but I think it goes without saying that, you know, a strong IP position, um, you know, that protects, you know, you and gives you some exclusivity for a material amount of time uh, is important in this space. Um, sometimes that comes as sort of trade secret, which is a whole nother topic that we can talk about, um, but can be, can be um, incredibly important and valuable as well. Um, you know, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll double click on this concept in a second, but um, we, we also think about sort of does, you know, how long does it take to get to human proof of concept? Um, or if it's a, if it's a very, very new sort of biology idea, sort of when, you know, maybe it's not human proof of concept, maybe it's preclinical proof of concept, but sort of when do you sort of materially de-risk the idea that you're pursuing? Um, in part because one of the things that, that we think about and entrepreneurs should think about is, um, you know, the, 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 the cost of capital goes down significantly after um, you are able to de-risk the idea. And so if you're able to sort of efficiently execute and get to those milestones that are really de-risking in the minds of others, um, you, you are then able to sort of raise more money at higher prices, which then allows you as an entrepreneur to do more with that money, potentially, uh, if it's a platform, go broader um, uh, and, and deeper. And, um, and so we always think about sort of, you know, what, what's the time to really proving this is an awesome idea. Um, and last, but certainly not least, and certainly not the, the, the end of the list, but, um, you know, competition is important. Um, we always sort of think about what does the landscape not just look like today, but what is it going to look like in five years or maybe 10 years, depending on sort of how far the idea, um, uh, you know, uh, is, along, is along today and how long it might take to sort of actually get to a commercial population. Um, and it's not, it's not so much about sort of the number of competitors. I think actually we, we, we don't care about that. It's about sort of the quality of the competitors and whether, you know, the idea is truly differentiated. Um, you know, if, if, if an idea sort of gets through that gauntlet, um, I, I think it has a, a quite good chance of being a very big, you know, very sort of seismic shift type idea. Um, and then, you know, we also think about sort of the team. So, um, you know, what's the existing team look like? Uh, how can we be helpful to you as entrepreneurs bringing good people around an idea? Um, one of the wonderful aspects of, of Ben Rock and its 50 plus year history is that we have a fantastic network of advisors and prior CEOs and prior management teams and even current teams um, where, uh, you know, our network and ability to help um, you recruit a team is, is um, you know, I think uh, truly exceptional. Um, Venrock also has a, an internal talent team, uh, two, two colleagues of mine, Shara uh, and Isabella, uh, 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 help us tremendously on the investment side um, really, their focus is is you know how how do how can they make sort of Venrock portfolio companies great in terms of talent, um, and so we we rely on them um, quite a bit, and they're a wonderful resource for our entrepreneurs as they think about sort of building out um, you know the exec level team and and also uh, you know folks on the you know early stage science side and 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 sort of all of the verticals. Raquel, if I could actually interject here really quickly, um, just to remind everyone, we are taking questions live. So again, feel free to use the Q&A uh, function to uh, input your questions. We did get a question that actually dovetailed perfectly with the slide that we just went over, which is covering what do you look for in founding teams and products? Uh, would it be possible to maybe if we could double click on the teams? I think there are probably people within the participant list who are curious, hey, hey, I have an idea. Do I need to have a fully fleshed out team? Um, or um, what about my role as a potential CEO in bringing forward this, uh, this new idea? What is Venrock's thoughts around that? Yeah, great. Thanks, Joe. Um, and, and please, everyone, please do ask questions um, as we go through. I'm happy to make this interactive. Um, so, so no, the team does not need to be fully built out. And in fact, that's one of the, um, I think, wonderful things about working with us is we can help you with that. Um, we've got internal resources, as I've just mentioned, our talent team who can help with that. Um, and um, we certainly don't have any expectations that the entire exec team is sort of built out to a T, especially in the early stages. Um, I think, I think uh, it, it, Joe, you, you also asked, um, you know, what do you look for in a team? And I think that's really, that, that's really important. So, um, you know, of course there's kind of table stake stuff like, 
um, being deep in the space, uh, being creative, um, you know, I think being um, someone who, being someone who um, is thoughtful and I think mature takes feedback well, because frankly, um, you know, a lot of building a company and then sort of, you know, working with investors um, and your team, um, it's like a five, 10 year marriage, sometimes longer than that. Um, and so you want to be able to, to work well with other people. I mean, that sounds so cliche, um, but, but it is so important because, you know, we certainly don't expect um, uh, first time CEOs to know exactly how to do the CEO job. And I would say that, you know, I think we, we, we took um, a look at our portfolio and realized but we have a tendency actually to gravitate towards first time CEOs. So it's not a, you need to have done this, you know, three, four or five times and, um, you know, have done sort of every job in biotech before you become a CEO. We've actually had uh, great uh, uh, luck and uh, with, with, with folks who are first time. Um, and, and it's all to say that I think folks who approach problems with humility you know, want to get the smartest people around a problem, want to get the resources, can put their hands up when they don't know something. Because frankly, we, I mean, there are things I don't know. There are things that we all don't know. Like, I think it's the humility aspect that's so important. Um, and the last thing I'll say on sort of some of the, 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 the sort of softer aspects are, are we, we actually, Benrock has a podcast called Running Through Walls, which, which I think, um, uh, is sort of named around a central thesis that we look for um, in, in companies and leaders. Uh, it, it, it's sort of, you know, entrepreneurs' um, ability to sort of push through problems, right? To, to, to solve them in real, to try to solve them in real time with the best information they have. Um, when they encounter something that is seemingly impossible, and frankly, most of what we invest in are ideas that the rest of the world thinks are impossible, um, and, uh, and, and, and we don't, and our entrepreneurs don't. Um, and so we really look for folks who have that kind of grit and hustle and creativity and spine um, to, 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 to run through walls. Um, and, 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 and really sort of deliver and, and hopefully eventually get therapeutic to patients. Awesome. Thank you for answering that question. Um, we have many other questions are flowing in. I do want to be mindful of time. I can also keep track of these questions and then we can continue to maintain flow and then we can bring it back towards the end if I'm starting to see recurring themes. Sounds good. Thanks for moderating, Joe. That's great. Um, okay, good. So I'm going to keep rolling on company creation. Um, it, just a couple examples is certainly not an exhaustive list of, of what we have uh, done on the on the the, the Venrock company creation side. Um, but but a, a couple, and we're going to sort of double click into into Federation one that that, that I recently started. So Ariosa diagnosis uh, di diagnostics was started around novel technology around. Um, non-invasive prenatal testing, which now is standard of care. There's New England Journal uh, studies that have been published on the Ariosa technology. It was acquired by uh, Roche um, and is now, uh, as I said, sort of you know the gold standard test that um, women get when they are pregnant. Um, it was it was it was sort of envisioned um, around replacing the invasive um, sort of amniocentesis type tests. Um, it was a, a non-invasive sort of blood test where you were able to, to, to measure and um, query fetal DNA. Um, that was started by uh, Ken Song um, and, uh, and, and Brian Roberts and John Stultnagel. John Stultnagel was the original CEO and founder of Illumina, um, which was another Venrock company I think that Elliot mentioned. Um, he's been a, a wonderful advisor to us and has been involved in uh, a number of our, our companies, Federation included, he's involved in 10X, he's involved in Inscripta, um, and, uh, and, and again, it's just a, a wonderful resource for our entrepreneurs and our, our companies. Federation, we'll talk about in a second. Lyra is a company on the healthcare IT side of things, uh, started by David Ebersman and, uh, and, and two colleagues of mine uh, at, at Benrock, Bob and Brian. It was really about sort of how to navigate and make more accessible the mental health provider system. Um, a really, really interesting company solving really big problems in that space. Um, and, uh, uh, and one to certainly keep an eye out for. And then um, a, a recent example on the therapeutic side is a company called Virologic, which was um, based on some technology that came out of Michael Birnbaum's lab at MIT. 
um, and also Michael Fishbach at, at Stanford, really around sort of dialing in uh, specificity of, uh, of, of cell therapies and, and gene therapies um, and, and being able to sort of tap into novel tissues that were not being able to be targeted before. So super exciting company. Um, so on to, uh, uh, I guess, before we get to, to Federation specifically, um, uh, we have sort of a framework that we think about uh, with, with sort of how to start a, a biotech company. Um, and, and really, there's sort of four pillars. The first is, is great founders. Um, you know, obviously, uh, the, the idea um, and also sort of the, the, the initial people around it. It's not to say that the founders necessarily need to be the management team. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. Um, uh, but, but folks who, you know, are, are really um, thinking about this company as a legacy project for them, not sort of, uh, I'm going to start this and, you know, not be super invested or dedicated to it and maybe start something else in a, in a year or two. Um, it, that's, a, that, that's certainly a strategy and a style that works for some people, but for us, we really gravitate towards folks that um, really want to, to continue to be involved um, in the idea that, that, that the company is founded around. The second is um, we've talked about sort of the importance of a team, so I won't spend too much time on it, but um, recruiting an A-plus team it gets to, I think, one of the questions that was asked around, you have to have the team in place uh, now, and the answer is no. Um, but, but um, you know, hopefully the, the idea um, being what it is, being compelling, being big, um, you know, makes it easier to recruit a great team uh, around that. Um, the third thing is, can this become an extreme outlier business? Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about, about what that means, but uh, it, it sort of encompasses some of the things we talked about around, you know, will it go after a disease with high unmet need? Um, will it be differentiated from everything else that's out there? Will it become standard of care um, and, and help, you know, cure or meaningfully impact disease in some way? Uh, so those are all things that we think about on, on sort of extreme outliers. Um, and then the, the last but, but, but not least is, is, you know, can we come up with a, you know, capital efficient uh, milestone driven plan? Um, and Elliot's going to talk about sort of what does that mean in a couple of slides, um, but it, it's certainly important to sort of, you know, is it going to take, you know, 10 years and hundreds of millions of dollars to sort of de-risk the idea, or can we make some real strides in you know, a year or two years or three years um, and, and, and really start to see, um, you know, the inkling that we really have something. So that's a nice segue into sort of the background on Federation. Um, <clears throat> so Federation was, uh, was, was, was um, initially based on the work um, coming out of uh, two professors' labs, Michael Fishbach and Dylan Dodd, who were both at Stanford. Um, Michael, um, you know, has a really unique background. He's a card-carrying chemist by training, uh, and and you know, really has has sort of approached the microbiome field with a rigorous um, uh, uh, sort of bar for understanding uh, the function of microbes. Um, you know, and and how complex communities um, sort of work with one another. Um, he also, you know, I think is is very rigorous in terms of sort of standards around you know, identifying exactly, you know, who's there, how do we know they're there, um, and, and really pushing um, the field forward there. But, but you know, a combination of sort of rigorous tools, uh, a focus on function, uh, and the members at hand um, ha ha really make, make him an interesting um, sort of person in, in this field. Dylan is an MD, PhD by training, so he has the sort of clinical uh, piece here, uh, in addition to the, micro the deep microbiology piece. Um, and he was incredibly helpful in the early days um, and continues to be as we thought about sort of, you know, clinically, where could we go with the idea? Um, and and it's, it's probably worth sort of outlining what, was, what the idea was. And you can certainly um, look at the Federation website uh, and, and learn more. Um, but the idea uh, started as sort of, you know, can we uh, sort of rethink the microbiome field as a, you know, engineered cell therapy? Um, whether engineering is, you know, the number of members. So can we build complex communities to tackle diseases and, you know, frankly, be able to sort of, you know, intervene in a multinodal uh, uh, mechanism, um, you know, on in terms of sort of uh, the immune system, you know, retrain the immune system, you know, make beneficial metabolites, uh, degrade toxic metabolites, uh, restore gut barrier function. I mean, the list goes on and on. One of the, the beautiful things about um, sort of a, 
a, a complex cell therapy approach is that you really can intervene at multiple nodes, um, you know, and, uh, you know, can you potentially engineer microbes uh, to do, uh, you know, a, a function perhaps, uh, you know, enhanced of what they do or perhaps non-native um, and, and um, potentially retrain the immune system. So it was around that idea that that we got excited and that was um, in, uh, 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 sorry, that was in um, mid 2018 that, that we started working on this idea. We were uh, lucky uh, in that after we sort of pulled together a plan, um, we started to, um, I think, attract the interest of some really, really top talent um, who wanted to, 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 to sort of join the effort. So Lee Swam was uh, was was the uh, he was the first hire. He was our he he is the CSO there. He was the CSO at Acadian, uh incredibly smart, uh, brilliant, talented leader, um, and uh, uh, joined uh, Federation even before we founded the company. Um, was was really instrumental in uh, in in developing the early plan. Um, uh, John Stoltnagel, I've already mentioned, he's a board member and advisor to the company. Uh, he, he was quite interested in this space and there's a lot of really interesting sort of data, uh, uh, genomic, applied genomics um, and um, uh, uh, just interesting, interesting sort of mechanistic uh, insights that, 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 that I think are uh, underpin the entire field. Um, and he was incredibly excited about joining the, the opportunity. Um, Emily Connolly is now the, the CEO of, um, of, of Federation. She joined about a year ago. She was um, a sort of decade long veteran at 23andMe. And, um, and she, uh, she, she, she worked closely there um, in sort of transitioning that business to not just a sort of consumer genomics business, but also them getting into um, some, some, some very deep drug development around the insights that that data set um, that they have around sort of genomics uh, provided. Um, and uh, Emily's been a, been a wonderful leader at, uh, at Federation. And then last but certainly not least, Melissa Rutlinski worked alongside me uh, in the early days of pulling together the plan. She was um, a, a senior member of the team at, at Intercept, which is a company down in San Diego uh, that, that did quite well. Um, and uh, she's just a, a, a wonderful sort of strategic thinker and operator and um, was really instrumental in um, the early days and continues to be instrumental uh, in the in Federation success. Um, we've talked about sort of what what extreme outlier is, so I'll, I'll, I'll not go down that that road. Um, and, and then uh, Elliot's going to <clears throat> hit on sort of what is a what do we mean by a capital efficient milestone driven plan? So um, I'll just I'll just uh, close by saying, you know, these, these processes of sort of starting a company are, um, they're a lot of work uh, and, and we want to do the work alongside of you. Um, you know, it, it took us probably the better part of six, six months here, as you can see on this kind of timeline at the bo bottom from first starting to work with Michael and Dylan, pulling together the plan, the team, um, and, uh, you know, opening the doors to the company uh, in January of 2019. Um, and it's all to say that I think it's, it's time well spent and, and uh, you know, one of the pieces of advice that I have um, for entrepreneurs is always, you know, think about, um, you know, your potential investors as, you know, they're, they're getting to learn what it's like to work with you, but you're also getting to learn what it's like to work with them. Um, and I think that, that over this time that, that, you know, you potentially can spend with them and then with you. Um, you, you really start to get some, 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 I think, real data points on what it's going to be like to work together. So um, it's all to say, don't, you know, uh, the, the, don't rush the process. I think there's, everyone feels urgency around wanting to get the company off the ground, but doing it the right way um, can really make your life easier in the long run. Elliot, over to you. Yeah. So we're going to do a little bit of zooming in on some of the things that Raquel mentioned in the uh, outlier business and operating plan um, aspects of company creation. And so we're going to talk about indication selection, and we're going to talk about um, building an experimental plan for a uh, you know, nascent company and, and what that looks like and what are the different things you should be thinking about. So. The first, so this first thing we're going to talk about indication selection, I just at a very high level, I, I think you should emphasize why it's so important to think about this. Uh, you know, I don't know everybody who's in the audience, but um, I can relate to my own PhD training that we didn't spend a lot of time thinking about specific indications and diseases and, uh, and the questions that surround them. So, 
and you know, when you're an investor or an entrepreneur, those things matter a lot. And that's really because small companies will live or die based on the indication that you choose to apply your technology to. Um, you know, whether or not your first indication works out in the clinic will determine whether your company is successful. It will determine whether investors want to give you money if it, if it seems like it's the right fit um, for that indication. So we're going to talk about how you might go about picking um, an indication for your technology or for the company that you're trying to build so that you can be successful and attract investors. Um, so the, I'm going to talk about this framework. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that each of these different kind of like you can see this funnel, like we're going to talk about different filtering steps that you might think about. And each of these steps is really necessary um, to end up at an indication that uh, works for your company, but none of them on their own is sufficient. So you have to think about all of them. Um, the, the first one is this idea of science fit. Um, so can your technology actually address the disease mechanism? Um, you know, this really comes down to questions that start as simple as uh, you're trying to drug a transcription factor that's driving a particular cancer. You're going to want to use a modality that is going to be able to enter the nucleus and drug that transcription factor, right? It's that kind of a science fit. Can you actually address the mechanism with the modality that you're developing? Um, so, you, you know, you really have to start there and, um, and, then, and then move forward. And the next thing you might move forward to is the idea of unmet need. And uh, you might think that the idea of unmet need and understanding it is as simple as asking the question of how many people are affected by this disease. Um, but we re I really want to emphasize that it's the thinking here needs to be much deeper than that. Um, you need to really understand the population that you can address. And um, the way that you might do that is think about sort of the subpopulations of patients their genetics, uh, the specific mutations in those populations. Um, what, you know, what's the disease course? When are therapeutic interventions actually possible in a meaningful way? And, uh, and will you be able to you know, capitalize on some of those uh, disease course moments where you can meaningfully impact a patient? Uh, what's the standard of care across those different disease, uh, disease states? And, and, and you know, so are you gonna be able to uh, to, to be comparable or better than the standard of care at, at each of those points. And once you've built out that understanding, then you can really confidently say, this is the unmet need for this disease population and, and, and we think it's uh, significant and we think our, our therapy is gonna get at it. So, you know, speaking of this idea um, of, uh, you know, other standards of care, it, you have to also understand the competitive intensity in a given indication. And again, this is one of those questions that sort of on its face, seems like it might be simple. You might ask, okay, well, how many, what's the number of companies that are working in this indication, trying to solve this indication? But you have to really go deeper than that if you want to be um, really making a compelling case for the company that you're trying to build. So you might ask instead, what are the different approaches being used? You know, dig deep into the science of each of these companies that you identify and really identify the mechanism that they're trying to use to get after the indication. And once you've built out that really educated position, you can scientifically evaluate your comp your competitors and you can make a case or not that your approach can realistically be better than those. Um, and then lastly is this idea of clinical development, which again is one of those topics that we really don't talk about in PhD training, at least maybe there's some MDs in the audience who, who think about things like this. but. Uh, you know, questions of what's the clinical development path? How long is my clinical trial going to be at each, at each phase? Uh, how are we going to actually identify patients? How are we going to find them and recruit them into our trial? Um, you know, what are those resources that we might use? Patient, uh, patient organizations that have registries that you can pull on, things like that. Um, so it, it, uh, and one aspect for, you know, people to think about here is maybe what's been done in the history of that indication. Uh, what's the clinical development look like in the past? And you can really use that as a, as a way to inform your, your new position. Okay, so uh, just emphasize that, and I, maybe, maybe it's clear from what we went over, that it's really hard to pass all these filters. Like finding your first indication for your technology is not something that you just um, stumble onto. It, it's a lot of work and, um, and it's worth putting it in because as I mentioned at the beginning, 
I mean, your company will live or die based on your first indication, whether investors believe it's right and whether you can really help the patients. So spend a lot of time thinking about this. Okay. Uh, and then, like other act- yeah. Sorry, if I could actually interject. So I am trying to moderate the questions so that they fit in within the general flow of what we are discussing through the deck. We do have one question that came up pretty early uh, that's asking about the process and due diligence, especially for uh, cancer diagnostics technology. I think in the examples that you provided, it was very therapeutics focused. Is there anything that we would tweak in in this general funnel for the due diligence process for a cancer diagnostic? You know, it, yeah, oh, sorry, so, Elliot, uh, feel free to, to, to add. I was going to say on diagnostics specifically, um, IP is actually something that gets elevated earlier in the diligence process. Um, they're, they're, um, for lots of reasons, case law and, um, you know, just the dynamics around um, uh, clinical diagnostics these days. Um, but but um, what we look for is is not necessarily sort of you know a new anal, you know analyte that can be detected or a new marker um, because oftentimes it's very easy to sort of copy that with other technologies. Um, it's it's really about sort of do you have a, a a novel differentiated sort of technical advantage for how you. Um, identify X, Y, or Z. That typically uh, ends ends up being sort of the more interesting and protectable position. So anyway, that's that's very specific, but um, that, that that is one of the things that um, you know, IT t- t- typically for therapeutics ends up being something that uh, we look at later in the process. We sort of assume that you know if you say that you've got you know strong composition of matter protection out to twenty forty. Um, we, we assume that that is likely the case um, and, and, and we'll look at it later in the process. On the, on the diagnostic side of things, um, protectability ends up being a bigger question earlier. Mm. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, Raquel. So we're going to talk about this idea of uh, planning. Oh, I've gone black here. Are we good on the slides? Yeah, good. Okay, thank you. Uh, so... I want to just talk about the different aspects that go into building a a really deliberate experimental plan, some of the strategy that goes into it. And the reason that I, that I want to go over this is, you know, why is it important to entrepreneurs? Why is it important to investors? Um, But for entrepreneurs, it's really important to, uh, it's a really good thing to, uh, to to communicate the experiments that you're going to do to your investors when they're going to get done. And so on the slide here, I have this thing that's called a Gantt chart, which is basically a really effective way to look at different experimental objectives over time and how these different tasks are interrelated. Um, and these interdependencies are you know, really important in, the idea, in, in building a lot of experiments uh, that are obviously, you know, maybe you have to take material from one experimental pipeline and put it into another and things like that. So, For an entrepreneur, you want to understand when your experiments are going to get done. You want to project to your investors that you have a strong plan, that you're responsible. Um, And you want to be able to organize your employees along all these different dimensions. Um, And and so we're going to just kind of dig into the different aspects of this chart um, and talk about how they influence your strategy. So first... Uh, we, we're going to talk about the, uh, where you're going to actually do the experiments. Um, you say you're founding your company out of a university, out of your lab, right? Um, maybe that lab is an expert in biochemical screening assays, right? So you can see on the left here, you can continue doing some of that work in biochemical screening at your university, or you could maybe port it over to your startup right away. What are the trade-offs in making that decision? Well, if you keep it at your university, maybe say you gain speed, right? You don't have to port the assays over. You're not going to lose time teaching teaching new employees at the startup how to actually make, uh, how to actually do those experiments and get results. Um, But the trade-off is that you may end up paying increased licensing fees to your university um, or not have control over the full-time employee who's running the experiments. And uh, another sort of trade-off that you might find yourself making in terms of where you're going to do the experiments is say you have to make a large amount of drug material um, that you're gonna use in your assays. So, you know, if you look again on the left, you have the choice, you could do this maybe at a contract research organization that specializes in manufacturing, 
Um, or you could think about building out manufacturing facilities in your company. Um, and again, trade-offs, you're gonna lose control over this process if you do it at a CRO, um, but it's gonna be more capital efficient. You're not gonna have to build out manufacturing. Um, now, one thing to consider is maybe your company, actually the innovation is the material that you're producing. So like think of cell therapy companies that benefit enormously actually from building out their manufacturing early because it's actually part of their innovation to be able to manufacture cell therapies effectively. So these are just some of the trade-offs, some of the strategy that goes into, you know, your experiments are probably not gonna all be done under one roof anymore. Um, so deciding what roof they're done under, uh, do it early and, uh, and it will benefit you. Okay, the next thing is uh, that you really wanna try to use your scientific training to inform your decisions. And this really comes down to just picking the best assays. And I know this sounds obvious, um, but it really does take a, a, a careful eye to say, really, what am I gonna learn from this model? What have people used this model to say in the past? And if you have a really sober interpretation of all the cellular or animal models that you're using, um, you can really de-risk your scientific process early on. Um, and you know, as investors at Benrock, we really think about that scientific risk and how we can de-risk it as early as possible um, as a major factor in whether we're, you know, in how we're thinking about an investment. And one of the things that we really like to do is build out that plan with our entrepreneurs. Um, you know, we have scientists on staff, we have operators on staff who are really good at this. And, uh, and, and we, you know, entrepreneurs would benefit from having a team that will do that. And uh, Benrock is one of those teams. So, I just, you know, one of the one of the biggest risks in a startup is your R&D plan, uh, your early R&D. So do whatever you can to de-risk it and be really thinking well about this is one way to do it. Oh, another aspect that I want to emphasize here, actually, I'm sorry. Uh, it, it, another thing you might want to think about is setting milestones for yourself. So for each assay, if you have a good understanding of it, you can say, oh, we want to, you know, we need to see, say we're trying to degrade a protein we need to see a two-fold reduction in the levels of this protein in this particular model to believe that we are actually on the right track. And planning out your, your assays like this from the beginning can really set your bars for success and uh, tell you about how to move forward in your programs. Okay, uh, another idea that's really important is um, cash efficiency. And the Gantt chart really helps you do that because first of all, it helps you organize your sort of your work streams to just essential efforts. So you can see we only have four experimental work streams in this company. And obviously this is a simplified sort of generic version of what this chart might look like, but we're really reduced to essential efforts, manufacturing, uh, in vitro biochemistry, and uh, in vivo efficacy and talks, right? This is really all we're thinking about. Um, so being cash efficient is just thinking about those killer experiments that will decide whether your company is going to succeed or fail. And plotting them out on a Gantt chart like this can help you really push those experiments up in time so that they're happening as soon as possible. Uh, you know, you want to get to those killer experiments that tell you whether your company has legs as soon as possible. First of all, as an entrepreneur, you ought to be truth seeking. You want to know whether your idea is really going to work. You know, your company doesn't exist just to be a company. It exists to make a medicine. So you, you want to find out if you're actually going to be able to do that as soon as possible. And from, from the standpoint of your relationship with your investors, it's really important to do that because it's going gonna, it's gonna to, first of all, prove to your investors that you're you know, really thorough and, and smart, but it also can help you guys pivot if there is a need to pivot, right? You can use the remaining capital to start testing other ideas if you do the killer experiment early. And I can't speak to my own experience because I haven't been doing this for long enough, but from what I understand from older investors, it is a, a very good look for an entrepreneur to do the killer experiment early, communicate to the investor that that experiment did not work. And the investor is not going to think that you're a failure of an entrepreneur. On the contrary, they're going to think you are a truth-seeking, responsible, good scientist who they would back again in the future. So thinking about these killer experiments, pushing them up in time, um, it really would behoove you as an entrepreneur. Okay, um, quickly, because I think we're coming up on time, I wanna have some time for questions. Um, 
another thing that you really ought to do, and Gantt charts are great at helping you do this, is build out your budget. Now, this is really important because you come to an investor, you say, how much money? They say, how much money do you want? And you say, $10 million. And you should have a real reason for why you need that much money. And laying out experiments like this with their costs can really tell you what your cash needs are for a given period of time. Um, and then now I want to touch on this other concept really briefly, which is the idea of a value inflection. And Raquel sort of spoke to this earlier um, for, for you know, these like key de-risking moments. So if you take a look at the chart um, and, and look at this uh, testing candidates versus competitors in rodent models, I have this experiment written out. So this experiment, say you get a good result, say your, mo your molecule performs way better than competing molecules in these rodent models, that, that now represents a value inflection for your company, right? You have shown that your molecule is successful in what is hopefully a well-picked animal model, if you listen to my earlier slide, um, and it's better than competitors even. So at this point, you've now de-risked something key and your company has become uh, more valuable and more likely to succeed all at once. And that's a value inflection point. Um, and so you can go with those results in hand to additional investors and try to raise new capital. So this new bar has appeared on our Gantt chart for the months of February to May, you're gonna be raising new capital with those results. Um, okay, so yeah, I, I hope that that was a helpful way to think about how to plan experiments. And, and I didn't see a Gantt chart until I started working with venture firms, um, but reflecting back on my PhD work, I actually think that you can make Gantt charts for PhD work as well. Um, and then it might help you uh, make your paper um, happen more quickly. Uh, so uh, I want to just summarize the, the general topics that Raquel and I covered. We, we talked about something that Ben Rock does, which is build outlier businesses with great founders, A plus teams, and milestone driven plans. That's our approach. Hopefully, we told you a little bit about why it's good. Um, and then, more specifically, on some of the education points we covered. Uh, the idea of selecting your lead indication using this funnel of scientific fit, unmet need, uh, competitive intensity, and the clinical development path. And then these aspects of R&D planning that are based around you know, using your deep scientific knowledge to pick your experiments, being capital efficient, doing those killer experiments early, um, and being really efficient with, uh, with your different work streams, and then being efficient with your budget, being aware of your budget, and identifying those value inflection points so that you know when your company is succeeding and when it's becoming uh, more valuable. Super. So um, this is, I think this is our last slide. Um, you know, we are always um, looking for, for great folks um, and that can come in, in lots of different sort of flavors. Um, you know, we of course are always looking for talented um, entrepreneurs that are interested in building a company, interested in building a company with us. Um, we, uh, you know, uh, are, 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 you know, sort of always looking for great folks for our team on the, 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 the venture and investing side of things. Um, so those folks can help us, you know, dig in on diligence, um, think about new company ideas, um, and, and potentially sort of, um, uh, the, the third bucket is, you know, we have companies that are always looking for wonderful, wonderful folks, um, that want to get involved in sort of small companies, uh, that are on a, you know, on a, a steep and exciting sort of trajectory. Um, and so um, if, if any of that sounds interesting to you, uh, we definitely want to hear from you. You can email our talent team, uh, talent at venrock.com. It's on the, on the slide here. Um, and uh, uh, certainly if you, if you have interest in, in starting a company or building your company uh, with, with someone like Venrock, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Elliot directly, um, our contact information is on the, the Venrock bios uh, that we have uh, on the Venrock website.